So our last speaker for this morning um, is Anisha Gupta, um, and she's presenting a co-authored paper presentation. Anisha is the Andrew W. Mellon Fellow in Paper Conservation at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. She is a graduate of the Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation, where she specialized in works on paper with a minor concentration in photographic materials. Her previous experience includes graduate internships at Tate, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Currently, Anisha serves on the AIC's Equity and Inclusion Working Group. Um, and her co-author, um, who, who is not here today, um, Victoria Binder, is a conservator of works on paper at the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. She received her BA in art history from NYU in 1997 and her MA in certificate in art conservation um, from, this, from the State University College in Buffalo in 2007. And prior to working at the Fine Art Museums in San Francisco, she was a fellow at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and held conservation positions and internships at the Brooklyn Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, NEDCC, and three private practices. Um, and her publications and presentations have included innovations in dry cast pulp fills for seamless repairs, digitally generated fills for photographs, um, an iPad system for microscopes and research on offset lithography, and the making of the San Francisco psychedelic rock, rock posters, which I think we will be hearing about um, from Anisha in their presentation. So please welcome Anisha. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Um, get set up here. Uh, so 2017 is the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love in San Francisco. And to mark the occasion, the De Young Museum organized the exhibition, The Summer of Love Experience, Art, Fashion, and Rock and Roll. This was a dynamic exhi exhibition that truly was an experience as the visitor walked through the galleries, which recreated the sights and sounds of the summer of 1967. During the mid to late 1960s, thousands of young people converged on the neighborhood of Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco to take part in a scene of cultural and political rebellion, the apex of which was the Summer of Love. Along with this emerging counterculture was a growing music scene. Psychedelic dance concerts were held on a weekly basis at venues like the famed Avalon Ballroom and the Fillmore Auditorium, featuring bands like Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, The Doors, and Big Brother and the Holding Company. A series of posters and handbills were commissioned by the owners of the venues to promote the concerts. The posters designed by artists included Alton Kelly, Victor Moscoso, Rick Griffin, Wes Wilson, and Stanley Mouse and they reflected the colors and visual chaos of the dance concerts and the experimentation of the 60s counterculture. The posters could be found all over town, in storefronts, on telephone poles, and at the dance venues, and usually they were taken down as fast as they were put up by enthusiastic fans. Though some of the rock posters were screen prints, the majority were made using the process of photo offset lithography. The posters were printed at a number of small offset litho companies in, the San, in San Francisco, including Cal Litho, T. Trek, and Bindweed Press. The exhibition wanted to recreate the experience of being at the Summer of Love. There were a multitude of costumes throughout each gallery. Immersive video and sound installations recreated the experience of being at the Trips Festival in Golden Gate Park. Artist Bill Hamm put on his legendary light show in one of the galleries. Animated posters danced on a wall with colored lights, and the walls were covered with about 200 rock posters and ephemera. My talk today is divided into three parts and will focus on the display of works on paper in this unconventional and unpredictable show. The first part will explain our process of finding a way to display, display the posters and ephemera. During the second part, I'll walk through how we treated and displayed a billboard. And finally, I'll summarize some of the other types of materials we dealt with. For our show, our exhibition designer, Tomomi Itakura, was inspired by the famous display of the posters at the Fillmore. 
She wanted to recreate the feeling of being surrounded by the posters and inundated with color. Uh, this display meant no frames or window mats, but more in line with tacking the posters on the wall. And our job was to come up with a solution that was safe for the artwork, but also fit this vision. And on top of that, this show was originally meant to be in one small gallery. But with a new director hired last September, he moved the show to our main exhibition space and moved up the timeline so we had eight months to pull this together. So we quickly got going on brainstorming how to display the works on paper. One of our first ideas was to put it all up with rare earth magnets. Uh, we use the magnets all the time in the lab and we've put up many artworks uh, with this display. But uh, with over 200 posters, we weren't sure about the safety of so many magnets. We were worried about having magnets really close together since they attract each other so easily and strongly. Um, and we would also wanna be coloring or covering the magnets in order to match every poster. So decided against magnets. Uh, and this led to conversations across a lot of departments between the designer, the curator, the art handlers, the carpenters, and the mount maker to determine a display method that would be safe for the art, but also feasible in terms of labor and cost. So our first idea was to build large plexiglass vitrines that would be mounted onto the wall. Anywhere from three to 14 works of art would be attached to the back of the vitrine wall and all of the works would be covered with a large plexi bonnet. This was an unconventional solution for works on paper, but it allowed us to think beyond the frame. The vitrines allowed the curator to group posters together by theme, and it gave us a way to have a glazing over multiple posters at one time. There was a long discussion with the designer uh, about the depth of the case. She wanted it to be really shallow so the viewer had more direct access to the works, but we were concerned with static issues. Having a large sheet of plexiglass so close uh, to the work of the, the surface of the posters would likely cause the posters to be attracted to the plexi and pop out of the clips that we were putting them in. So we did some testing by mounting the posters on the wall and holding different depth cases up to the posters and we came to a compromise of a three inch case depth. At the same time, we tested plastic clips to hold the posters up because we really wanted an invisible look. Uh, these are mylar clips that you can sort of see uh, that had double stick adhesive on them, and the clip is adhered to the plexiglass and the poster just slides into the clips. So this held the poster up for a long period of time without any slipping, so we were confident that the clips would work during, uh, for the duration of the exhibition. And putting the posters into vitrines made us feel comfortable in preventing any visitors from touching the works or preventing any uh, dust accumulation. As we approached the exhibition date, however, the technicians and woodworkers who would have built these large cases ran out of time. They still needed to build platforms for mannequins and other complicated structures within the show, and they could anticipate that there would be no time on top of that to build over 20 large and heavy vitrines that would hold our works on paper. We, at this point, were five weeks away from installation, and the exhibitions department decided to scrap the entire plan for the works on paper and start over. So, as you can imagine, we were pretty shocked, uh, but after that initial stress passed, we tried to come up with a new solution, and quickly. So, there was uh, a bit of a scramble to figure out what we were gonna do, and a lot of ideas were thrown out, like Nielsen frames, which uh, is we have, I have a picture of on the left. They're inexpensive, inexpensive metal frames. Um, we also talked about different size vitrines that may cut down on the build time, or any other kind of frame out there. Uh, but framing the works was not in keeping with the vision of the designer or the curator, and in the paper lab, we were really determined to stick with that and come up with something else. And this thought process led us to another idea, simply sandwiching the works between two sheets of plexiglass. So this is an idea we had thought about earlier um, in the design process. It would consist of using the mylar clips that we'd already tested to hold the posters onto the plexiglass, then another sheet of plexi would be placed directly on top of the poster with the poster in direct contact with the plexi. Um, hardware called standoffs would hold the two sheets of plexi together and mount the whole sandwich onto the wall. While sandwiching between plexi is usually not the first choice for works on paper, it can be an appropriate and safe solution in some instances. The problem usually arises during the vibrations of travel when abrasion or ferrotyping could conceivably occur but we felt that this was safe as an in-house solution since it's not suitable for travel or for loans. In this case, sandwiching was used because it was inexpensive. It didn't create extra work for the technicians who would have built our cases. 
It also stayed away from framing the work so they didn't appear to be fine art. But, and it's not the first time the department has used this technique. It's been employed in the past to suggest an alternative purpose of a work on paper, such as with artist proof prints or other types of posters that we've displayed. And we've done it on numerous occasions and hadn't noticed any detrimental effects. And since our environment has a stable temperature and relative humidity, there was no fear of moisture condensation when the paper is in contact with the glazing. This is also a really important turning point for us in how we approach the show. We spent time really thinking about what was most important for us in the paper conservation lab in terms of display, and that was the safety of the artwork. Our main goal was to come up with a solution that would be safe, that was our priority, and then we had to work with the rest of the exhibitions team and work around their priorities. We had to compromise, but it was made easier through all of this discussion, and uh, so we knew where we needed to compromise and where we really had to stand our ground. So even though the sandwiches were a much more labor-intensive solution for the paper conservators, they involved the least amount of construction and fit within our budget. So we started the time-consuming process of putting the individual sandwiches together uh, for our 200 posters and ephemera. So this meant 1,000 pounds, or one ton of plexi, was delivered to our lab, and it was pretty overwhelming, but we managed to get all the work sandwiched in the week and a half time frame that we were given. But even when we got to the installation phase, a number of things came up where we had to simply make the best decision with the time and resources that we had. Our technicians did a really good job using templates and grids to hang the sandwiches, which had to be a really precise and accurate process, so they lined up in these grids perfectly. Once we started installing, we learned that the hardware that we were using could easily be twisted loose and the artwork could be taken off of the wall. So we found hardware that included a security screw and ordered those immediately. And we didn't have time to put the um, new hardware on every single work of art, so the curators uh, dictated the works of highest value and we replaced all of those. Uh, we also learned that you can see absolutely everything in the plexi margins, dust, debris, fingerprints, um, and we didn't have time to come up with a thoroughly researched solution, but we did create a protocol for the technicians to clean the plexi with brilliant eyes and these specific microfiber cloths. We figured it all out and the show went up and we were really happy with how it looked and we didn't have any issues that came up during the installation. One thing we didn't think about, however, was what to do with all the plexi once it was deinstalled. <laughs> Um, it's been surprisingly difficult even in San Francisco to find an organization that will take the plexi off our hands and recycle it, not send it to a landfill or to China, which is another option these days. Uh, so we worked on cleaning it up and packaging it up, packaging it to send it out, and I think I've sort of roped someone in to take it from us. So more on that. Um, so I'm going to move to the second part of um, my talk, which is this uh, amazing billboard, which we thought at an, a year ago would be the hardest part of our uh, exhibition, but was actually definitely the easiest, thanks to all of the planning we were able to do. So for this show, the museum's acquired a most exciting work of art, and uh, now the largest work of paper in our collection, a 10-foot by 21-foot billboard. Uh, the billboard wasn't in one piece. It actually consisted of 14 individual screen prints. There were originally 100 printed. Uh, 24 of these billboards were displayed. Four remain, and we now have one in our collection. So the story about this billboard goes that when the Avalon Ballroom lost their lease, they had to relocate to a venue on the Great Highway, uh, which is along the Pacific coast of San Francisco. The family dog put up these billboards to let everyone know that they were back. So this particular billboard was never displayed. The colors are fantastically vivid. Um, it was printed with day glow, so it was meant to be really, really bright during the daytime. Um, and it wasn't really meant to be seen at night with a black light. So when we acquired the billboard last year, it came very tightly rolled and it had minor edge tears. And unfortunately, it had been folded in half, so it had sharp horizontal creases, but it was in pretty good shape overall. So the first step was to flatten each of the uh, prints, which we did using only pressure. We put the prints between Holytex and Blotter and very heavy plexiglass for a long period of time. We didn't use any moisture because we were worried that the paper might expand too much during treatment, um, but we were also worried that it was a sensitive surface and the media was fry friable. We were already getting offset, um, so we stayed away from moisture. And the next step was to do some surface cleaning, which I did in the margins and on the verso, uh, because the inks were easily picked up, as I said. 
Um, I use these additive free polyurethane sponges. They're cosmetic sponges, which I love, um, by the company Cosmetics. And I mended tears using the Minter Dry Tear Guard Strips and Wheat Starch Paste. At this point, we decided it would be easier if some of the panels were attached as we got it ready for installation. Um, it wasn't feasible for the whole billboard to be attached and be one whole piece since it was so large, but we wanted to attach some of the panels and we considered a number of factors for this decision. First, the billboard would be installed over a doorway, so we wanted to minimize the number of panels that we had to get up at that height. We were also thinking about how it would be stored after exhibition. It would be rolled onto a tube and put into a box, and so the width of one panel, uh, which was two feet, was as wide as our storage areas could handle. We, we decided in the end to attach the panels in vertically in pairs, so panel one with panel eight, two with nine, et cetera. Um, and this is also how billboard would have originally been put up, and that made it a lot easier to install, we learned. Unfortunately, the panels didn't line up or register perfectly uh, when we laid them all out, so um, we had to figure that out as well. We put the whole billboard out and spent a lot of time figuring out how to, to register each individual panel so it would still be cohesive. Um, we did this on the floor of our reading room, which was the only room that would fit the entire billboard, but we were going to actually um, attach them in, our, in the lab. So we made these Mylar templates that would guide us as to where the panels would be placed and then attached. And to be really clear, that 14 and that 7 is not written on the work, but on the Mylar. Um, and then we did some testing to figure out how to attach the panels. So we tested attachment between two sheets of a similar, uh, of a paper with similar thickness and texture. And since there was overlap between the two sheets, we put strips of Japanese paper um, in the overlap on the front using uh, desiccated blotters, sorry, with Japanese paper using desiccated blotters and attacking iron. We tested Biva first and then a thick wheat starch paste and the wheat starch paste worked better and had a better hold um, and, it w and it had a lot less moisture. So we lined up two panels with our template, um, attached the front and then flipped it over and also did it on the overlap that was created on the Verso just to be as strong as possible. Final treatment step was to reduce a strong horizontal crease that each panel had from being folded in half. Uh, so to reduce the creases, I used a Japanese technique in scroll mounting called double mends. Uh, to reduce, uh, sorry, since the paper was so thick, this was successful in pulling the crease out. The technique consists of putting two strips of paper, in this case, Hiromi hinging paper, on the verso of the crease. Each strip is slightly off center from the crease, so the two strips overlap over the crease. Um, and then using desiccated blotters and attacking iron to pull out the moisture immediately. Uh, and this pulls the crease on to the, like the verso of the paper, flattening the crease and bringing it into plane. Uh, it was finally time to install the billboard. Um, so this was a whole other discussion on how to mount it. We used a magnetic mounting system to put it up with plastic coated rare earth magnets. So our technicians built this wooden frame that has magnetic shims over it that can attract the magnet. And then it's covered with black Tyvek so that it blended onto the wall, but also so that it creates a barrier between the metal and the billboard. The metal shims came in various thicknesses, so we did some testing to determine which thickness worked for the billboard. Um, and just to be uh, really safe, we also reinforced the billboard with these two inch by five inch hinges, which are Japanese paper that attaches to the top edge of the billboard. And then the rest of the paper is covered with black Tyvek to blend in again, and then it's staple gunned into the frame. And this was um, a technique that we had tested out uh, on another photograph that, we, that was very large and mounted in a similar way. So this is just a shot as we're installing it, uh, Victoria and I with two technicians on scissor lifts, and it happened very quickly um, and very easily. And Um, and this is it installed in the galleries. Um, and it looked great. It was really a showstopper in the room and it fit in really nicely with the rest of the works. And it doesn't look so giant in that room, which was kind of a bummer, but it looks great. <laughs> um, and then I'm just gonna, before I wrap up, I just wanna mention a couple of other things that happened in this exhibit. Um, one of the highlights of the show was a conservator curated gallery by Victoria Binder on the process of how the 
uh, posters were made. It was started, it starts with a video um, that Victoria directed with the printer David Lance Goins, explaining how an offset lithograph is made. The next wall includes cases with original artwork and the printing material that the artists use to create these prints. The third wall discusses color and the innovative way the rock poster artists use color to create a vibrating effect. And it ends with arguably the most popular part of the exhibit, the one that I saw the most on social media, which are these animated posters, which um, I think are so cool that we're gonna go through a little bit of work to show you the video. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the gallery was really a great example of how a conservator can be involved in an exhibition in a substantial and effective way. It was incredibly popular on social media, as I said, but it also was, was um, popular with the artists and the collectors alike. As I said, the animated posters were particularly a hit, and to display these, we used reproductions to be shown in front of the flashing colored lights and then put the originals right above um, the circles, as you can see. This helped us to avoid figuring out the safety of the posters under those lights, and it also made it easier for the viewer to see the actual work. I'll switch back. Oh, oh, it did, okay, well, it's fine. <laughs> uh, the gallery also contained original artwork, which was on a variety of media in um, all in the same cases. So this included thick illustration board, printing plates, acetate films, uh, acetate sheets, and film negatives. And we didn't have a lot of time to come up with a sophisticated solution around the buildup of the gases in the cases. So we put activated charcoal and zeolite paper to absorb anything in the air. Um, and the cases were also built to have a seam in front for airflow. So overall, this show was incredibly challenging, but really satisfying. We had to be organized while managing a very high quantity of materials, and it was important to communicate very clearly with our exhibitions team and be clear about what everyone's priorities were so we could troubleshoot more effectively. And I think it was a really successful show. Uh, one of the best parts of the show was how many artists we worked with to put this up. Um, I have a picture in the center there of Stanley Mouse with his um, famous Skeleton and Roses poster for the Grateful Dead next to the original art, which Victoria installed next to the original book page that he stole from SFPL, uh, San Francisco Public Library that he appropriated for the poster. Uh, Stanley has become a great friend of the lab and all of the artists that we worked with were so happy with the show and the recognition that they got. Uh, it was a great celebration of the artists and also of this time in San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha, that was great. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Just a second. Thank you. So with the ton of plexiglass mm -hmm. before mounting the posters, mm -hmm. did you have to do cleaning and did you, what was your protocol there? Because I know that can be time. -consuming. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I didn't really go into that, but it came, um, we had two different, th it was all plexiglass, but we had two different kinds, a clear plexi and a frosted plexi. And they came with either pla a pla sheet of plastic on them or a sheet of like kind of paper on them that we had to peel off, which was a, was a workout, just like get that off on both sides. And then, yes, we used Brilliant Eyes, sort of how we cleaned the plexi, we used Brilliant Eyes and the microfiber cloths to wipe off this residue that was left over. And that, that was a, like a huge process in terms of time as well. You said time before drying and then mounting. Yes. What was, um, I mean, I don't think, so the question was if there was time between uh, cleaning it and then putting the prints on. Um, we didn't have like a set protocol, but they were taking the, the sheets off of the plexi faster than we could mount them. Um, so it just sort of sat out in piles for a while. Yeah. Um, could you go, go into more detail about the clips that you used? Yeah. Um, so basically they're, um, and I can get you some of the more product info, but they're, they're sheets of um, these plastic clip, they, they come in a long sheet and it's meant to hold like thicker pieces of paper or like board um, and they have double stick adhesive on the back. So we basically cut those into really small little pieces. We put extra double stick on the back so it's stuck a little bit better and that's what we were using for the clips. 
Oh, and they kind of have a lip that's meant to hold the board in, pla in place, and we sort of trimmed that down. I have a picture of it. it so it's a J shape or a, a no. V shape? No, it's like a V shape. It's a V shape. I'll, just, I'll let this keep going. There's another question. Is there any more questions? Nothing? You worked really Fun hard to find this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Debbie. I'm really proud of them. So uh, if you want to contact us, we'll send you some um, samples of the original product that you can buy, which wasn't available until just recently. And then we'll send you a sample of one that we retooled. Because I think a lot of you paper people find them really useful. Yeah, Dean, did you have, did you? It's really hard to see these clips, sorry. Yeah. We can we can talk about it. Yeah. So those are the in the hand. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, okay, <laughs> the, so these clips are so invisible that they're impossible to photograph. So this was my best attempt at them. But basically, yeah, that's, um, that's a tweezer holding the plastic clip um, and placing it with the poster. And then I was trying to just show you what the, what the clips look like, which are clear, but they have the tape on the back. Yeah. So I only ask this because you mentioned the problems with anti-static and mm -hmm. not to expound on TrueView products here, <laughs> but um, just to wonder if you at all considered using Optium as an anti-static acrylic in this situation. We did. Um, it was cost prohibitive for this show. So just so you know, for future reference to contact me, because we sometimes will donate, not for the entire show, but we can help out in situations where there's a volume to be purchased at once. Great, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's like a ton, ton or half a ton. <laughs> <laughs> the ton margin is great. <laughs> I well, I think that's it for questions. So um, maybe we can just say thank you to Anisha and all of our speakers for this morning for the great talks.